Hey, you guys, we are going to be starting out today with looking at a response to questions that came to us when we asked, what do you want to hear about? And people said, we want to hear about the rapture. We want to know if it's real. Where is it at in the Bible? Uh, if it is, define it, place it, describe it. So stay tuned. We're going to start diving into that right now. Real Life presents the Jack Hibbs Podcast with intention and boldness to proclaim truth, equip the saints, and impact our culture. Today, if this podcast lifts you up and encourages you to live a more fulfilled life in Christ, then make sure you leave us one of those five-star ratings. To us, that's like saying amen or yes. Then that rating will encourage others to listen. Now open your hearts to what God's Word has to say to you. Here is Jack Hibbs. Hey everybody, welcome to today's installment of our uh, Jack Hibbs podcast. And first of all, we're very excited and delighted that um, the magnitude and multitude of you who have been hitting subscribe and signing up and listening, uh, we get to see, and I was just recently briefed on the the data behind the scenes on that, the, the listenership has been amazing. So we are encouraged. That's the greatest thing that you can do for us is to not only listen, but to subscribe and to share. And uh, you can do that by, of course, just simply going to jackhibbs.com and telling other people about the content, because that's how these things matter. So we put out on Facebook, I think it was, the other day, we asked you to provide topics that you are concerned about or topics that most um, uh, have come up in your conversations or ones that you're concerned about. And so overwhelmingly, justifiably so, have been the questions regarding last day's events. Questions from the millennium, we're going to talk about it. Great questions, by the way, about the millennium. Uh, questions about the rapture, what is it? Uh, questions about who's the Antichrist? Questions about does the Bible really predict the future? Uh, what do I do if it does? Uh, the world around me, what's going on? So we're not going to cover it all, obviously, in one uh, session together right now. Which, by the way, for those of you who are viewing this, do you see this really awesome little sticker? It says real life. I just thought, you know how the real professional guys that do podcasts have these really cool things? And it says like Turning Point USA or or something like that. So um, so that's what we're doing right here. For those of you who are just what, or listening right now, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But... Uh, this is real life. And so we're pretty excited about that. So here's the deal. Let's dive into this. Uh, let's let's take the next several podcasts. Let's, let's do this. Let's start from uh, defining the rapture. We'll define the rapture. And then in our following podcast, we will walk through the biblical chronology of end time events. How about that? You see, why do it that way? Because if we define the rapture, it covers several views we'll look at. And it's appropriate that when we lay down that foundation of biblical definition to the rapture, then we're going to be able to uh, place it in the right place or, or argue uh, why it's in this particular place. You're going to disagree. Some of you are going to disagree. That's totally cool. But know why we disagree. Uh, we're going to have some fun, though, together, because i got to tell you the reason why. I was saved at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa under Chuck Smith, and he taught pre-tribulation rapture. I believed it as a new believer because he believed it, and he taught it. And then I started studying other things, and I drifted away from a pre-tribulation rapture view, and I stopped being a pre-tribulational uh, rapture person. Uh, and I was, I held that position for probably three to five years, I would think. And, um, yet, uh, studying it, studying it, studying it more and more and more. I not only came back to a pre-tribulation rapture view, but I came back to a pre-tribulation rapture view with some word of a, with, with some way of a sanctified vengeance, uh, or passion, I should say, because, um, I understand both sides. I get both sides. And uh, one is, I have to tell you, one takes a lot of faith, and one takes a lot of discipline, and one takes um, a big burden off your shoulders, and one really sets a fire under you to be ready every day 
and to be obedient every day. The other one causes you to be waiting for other things to happen, waiting for looking for other things to take place. And it's quite interesting to realize that uh, if there is a concept or a construct regarding the Lord's rapture, um, it matters how and what you believe about it uh, because it's translated in what you get involved in regarding your day-to-day -day life. So we're going to iron all this stuff out and um, we'll have some fun. So the first thing I want you to do, if you're taking notes and all, and forgive me, you, you know I don't usually have my computer here, but I want to make sure that uh, I step through some verses and some arguments that are going to be uh, quite fun. So number one, write this down, please. One of the great questions that was asked was, how can you believe in the rapture when the word rapture is not even in the Bible? And I understand the question, but for those of you who speak Latin <laughs> or read Latin, my grandson's learning Latin right now. So he knows, he knows the meaning of this word. In the Latin Bible, the word rapture appears. Uh, rapturo or, or raptus or what what we would just simply say rapture that's the conversation that we use in in our english um in the latin bible it is the word rapture okay so if you have a latin bible it's there and so the question comes from our western american uh, english uh position i don't see the word rapture in the bible so i can't believe in it well, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but you believe in the Bible, right? I mean, there's a lot of things like that. So if you have a Latin Bible, the word rapture is there. If you have a Greek Bible, uh, the word harpazo is there for rapture, okay? If you have an English, it may not, uh, uh, or most often says caught up, two words. Two English words to describe one word, rapture, caught up. The word rapture means to actually be uh, quite suddenly and violently removed. It means to be taken out of or taken away from. M imagine this in your mind, being grabbed and like pulled off the train tracks. Because maybe you're walking down the train tracks and you're, and you're deaf. You can't hear that the train's coming and it's coming from behind you. To get raptured off the tracks is to be violently grabbed and taken away before the train destroys you, okay? So um, let's look at this. Let's look at what, um, how is the rapture defined in scripture? And so we know, number one, that it is a, a what, we're not talking about when it is. Let's just lay the foundation that it is. It is an event in scripture. So what is it? So let's define what it is. And um, I want to give you some scriptures. So I hope that you guys can either write these down or uh, if you're driving or flying or whatever you're doing, you can look at it later. But um, the rapture is specifically mentioned in scripture and context is everything that it's specifically mentioned in scripture regarding the church in our New Testament setting. See, why do you put it that way? Because there's been individual raptures that have happened. Uh, Elijah was taken up into heaven. That's a, that's a description of a rapture. Uh, Enoch is a great picture of God translating Enoch from earth um, right up into heaven. That's a type of rapture. Um, listen, the Bible tells us that Philip in a, in a limited fashion. Remember Philip in the book of Acts? He was preaching and people were accepting the Lord and he was preaching to, to the Ethiopian eunuch and God's using Philip. Uh, and then he is lifted and taken by the Holy Spirit and he finds himself suddenly in a different place in the book of Acts. I mean, that's crazy amazing, right? So do keep that in mind that um, the rapture is not an odd thing. There are hints of it throughout scripture. Uh, Isaiah 26 verses 19 to 21 is a pretty cool thing to look at in the Old Testament. But the rapture is the removal of the church. That's its function. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. We may not get to it all in today's podcast, but
We'll get to it. But I'm going to ask you to write these uh, verses down. The, the number one overwhelming rapture verse in the scriptures regarding you and I. Are you ready? It comes from Jesus himself. Jesus is the first one to tell us about the rapture. I'm going to ask you to put these puzzle pieces together. Number one, Jesus. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples just before he returned in the great ascension of Christ back to heaven, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I, I would tell you, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, oh, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So let's march through this for a second. Jesus said, don't let your heart experience seismology, seismos. Don't have an earthquake of worry and of fear. Why? Because if you believe in God, believe also in me. That's the gospel. In my Father's house are many mansions. We'll talk about what that means in another forthcoming podcast about mansions. What are these dwelling places? Well, whatever it entails, Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not kidding. I'm not fooling around. Jesus is saying this is incredibly, happily, profoundly serious. I go to prepare a place for you. So whatever the rapture event that he's describing, it's defined this way. I'm giving you this promise. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere, my father's house, because I'm going to prepare a place for you. In Texas, they would say for you all. That's really good. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. Qualifier. That where I am, there you may be also. Get that right now. Everybody, take a deep breath and take it in. Jesus says, I'm going. Where are you going, Jesus? To my father's house. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. There's awesome dwelling places there for you. I'm going to go prepare it. What does that mean? We have no idea, except that he's a contractor. Jesus was a contractor when he was living under Joseph's roof uh, in Nazareth. That's pretty cool. What is this contractor building? We don't have a clue, but it's going to be amazing. But when he's done, and when his father says to him, go, he's going to come and he's going to get you and I, or whoever, and he's going to take us to where he's been working. He's going to take us to where he's been preparing. You get it? He's going to take us to where he's been building mansions. Again, I'm not going to get into what mansions mean right now. Is it an actual dwelling? Is it an apartment? Is it your body? Is it, is it, a, is it a city? Is it a, we'll talk about that later. But the awesome thing is, is that Jesus makes it very clear. I got to go to go prepare, I'm going to come back, grab you, and take you to where I have been preparing. So friends, listen, if you believe uh, in a post-tribulation rapture view, as I used to, that makes it really tough. Because in a post-rapture view, uh, at the end of the tribulation period, you've got the church going up into the atmosphere, meeting Jesus, and coming back down to establish the kingdom. How in the world do you ever get John 14 fulfilled if that's the, if that's the truth? It doesn't work. I, I, look, I already did all the gymnastics on this, and you just tie yourself in a knot, among many other problems. But listen, I love you anyway. So I'm, I'm a pre-tribber, radic radically so. You, you'll see this. But um, here's one of the reasons why. Remember, we're defining what is the rapture. So forget about the placement. If you're pre Pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, doesn't matter. This is what it is. Revelation 3.10, Jesus says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour which shall come upon the world. The word implies the entire globe. 
the entire world, to test those who dwell on the earth. That's an amazing statement. That was given to the church at Philadelphia, book of Revelation. Jesus says, I'm going to keep you from an hour that is going to come upon the earth that will test all those who are earth dwellers. That's a cool thing because we're not earth dwellers. You and I, we have our citizenship in heaven, says the Bible. We're only here working right now for Jesus. We're working for company God to spread the gospel, to tell as many women, boys, men, boys and girls the gospel, and then we plan on getting out of here. So that's, that's wonderful. Again, we're talking about defining it. Okay, we're not talking about the placement. We're not even talking about yet the why of it. So Revelation 4, beginning at verse 1, this is very fun. So when you look at the book of Revelation, which is key, the book of Revelation gives you a perfect breakdown of the book when John is told, John, write this down. Write down the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are about to come. So the book of Revelation, chapter 1, gives an announcement that it's broken up into three chronological, we'll just call it dispensations. I know the word dispensation drives people crazy, but just calm down for a moment. Don't worry about it. Dispensations are three let's, uh, three epics. Or th How about this? If we go to L.A. and we go to a play or we go to a musical uh, and we're watching Les Miserables, they may have... Uh, three different breaks uh, for the entire three-hour presentation of that musical. Are you with me? Think of it that way. There are three breaks. That which was, John. Uh, the, the, the messenger says, John, write, write, write that down. And so what was, was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Write down the things that are, the letters to the seven churches. He writes those down. And the things that shall be. And that starts in chapter 4, verse 1. Are you ready? Here it goes. Revelation 4, 1. After these things, the word in Greek is meta tauta. Meta tauta is the word meta tauta, these things. After these things of the first compartment, the revelation of Jesus Christ, this is who he is. And by the way, go ahead and read it. It's awesome. It's the book of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the church. It's not about the Jews. It's not about the Antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's so amazing because it tells you there in chapter 1 that he is the one who lived. He came, lived, died, and lives again. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, somewhere around verses 4 through 8, it tells you that it's he who was dead, and behold, he's alive forevermore. Isn't that awesome? It's about him. And Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 um, also carry with it the descriptions and attributes of the Lord in the Old Testament. That's why you read about, we're not even going to make it. I'm looking at the time clock, you guys. It's like, we've, I've been talking for 18 minutes already. This is ridiculous. We haven't even gotten into this. Remember when Jesus says in Revelation, I walk through the midst of the seven lampstands? Not eight, not nine, seven, not six, seven. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches? <laughs> Those were seven churches in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. You can go right now, by the way, you can fly there and, and go visit. Those archaeological sites, they're there for real. They're not made up. When Jesus says, I walk through the midst of the seven lampstands, it tells you in the Bible that the lampstands are the churches and that Jesus walks through the midst of them. What's amazing about that is that the seven lampstands in the book of Revelation is the seven lampstands that's given to Moses in the book of Exodus and Leviticus regarding the lamps, the menorah. And you don't hear anything about it until you have Genesis well, you have Exodus and Leviticus, Genesis, of course, the first five books, the Pentateuch, given, given to Moses by God, mentioning the menorah that was in the wilderness and the menorah that was in the temple later on with the kings, with David and all. And then you don't hear about it until 
book of Revelation. If you read Genesis to Malachi, because you're Jewish, skip the entire New Testament and read the book of Revelation, you'll be shocked as a Jew to see how well you understand the book of Revelation. No one's going to understand the book of Revelation without reading the Old Testament. It's almost like a test. The book of Revelation, book of Revelation judges you and I. It basically says this. Hello. Hi. Excuse me. Have you read your Old Testament? Because don't even start reading here until you go and read the Old Testament because you're not going to get it. The dragon, the kingdom, all the stuff that's the, the, the descriptions of the heavenly and demonic entities. You got to go to the book of uh, the Old Testament to understand all that. So when it says, after these things, I looked, John says, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Notice. A door is open in heaven. John is the last apostle to have lived. John. He's the author of the book of Revelation. He's the pen, I should say. He's the quill. He's the pen. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Like a trumpet. It means it wasn't a trumpet. It was like a trumpet. Speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. After what? After you're up here. Isn't that great? Think of this. Walk the, just listen how this goes out. Immediately, John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. I have no idea what that means. When I think of rainbows, I think of the rainbows that you see uh, in, on a rainy day. This is a, a rainbow behind the throne of God that is in some way, shape, or form uh, resembles an emerald. I, I don't understand. That's weird to me, but that's amazing. It's going to be incredible. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. That's important. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You said, I thought there was one Holy Spirit. There is one Holy Spirit. But the seven spirits of God is answered in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Uh, you can read that later, but you'll hear about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of might, the spirit of power. And it goes on and it gives you the, the list there in Isaiah chapter 11. By the way, the thrones, the 24 elders, the 24 thrones, uh, we know who these guys are. We don't have to guess, and we'll find that out later. Uh, you can read ahead if you want, but check it out. From all of this, it takes place. The seven lampstands are burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6, Revelation 4, verse 6, Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. That's beyond description, in my opinion. You should look at some of the the ancients drew some pencil or chalk drawings or charcoal drawings of how they viewed that. And quite frankly, to scare your pants off, it's freaky. There's all kinds of angelic creatures before the throne of God. Uh, they don't all look the same. They have different orders, different authority, different functions, different looks. And uh, one of these four living creatures, if you look at just one of them, they have, they have eyes all around them. By the way, we know this for a fact. You say, how do we know? Because it doesn't say it. they had something that looked like eyes. That's typology. John, that would be John trying to describe something that he can't figure out. No, John says the four living creatures were full of eyes in the front and in the back. Wow. The first living creature was like a lion. This is so cool. The second living creature like a calf. My granddaughter asked me about this last night. Was it last night or this morning? 
last night. The third living creature, like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. There's a reason for that. So each of these things, each of these angelic creatures have one head. And they have four faces. One head, four faces. And the four faces represent, listen, the four faces described here, each of these creatures are the symbol types known in Scripture that refer to the four Gospels. They're related to the four Gospels. Those images of, of those faces, for example, I'll give you, I don't want to spend time on it yet, later, but we're out of time, uh, is uh, one is a face of a man. Luke's Gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Okay, that's just a hint for next time around. So you guys, like usually, if you attend the church here or you listen much, um, I didn't get through hardly anything. Um, but we're going to keep going on this because you've asked some great questions. We're going to give you arguments and answers. We're still working on defining the rapture. We're going to define the rapture in our forthcoming podcast. So mark this down as installment number one. We're going to have to wrap it up. It's been at it for 25 minutes now. So listen, you guys, like always, please hit subscribe. Tell people about this. Join in. Make this almost a little small group thing. Take this podcast. Get some people together. Play it. Talk about it. Get your Bibles open and let's grow. Um, but it's, listen, it, more than ever, it's time to live out. It's obvious that it's time to live out your, your faith. It's time to live out uh, what you believe in. And that's why we say it's time for real life. Well, look at the days around us. It's absolutely insane. So again, go to jackhibbs.com. We want you to uh, hit subscribe. Uh, let us know. Give us a rating. That really helps us. It sends it. Look, we're going to live with, with or without your rating, but it sends a message to the tech giant guys that people care. So they, that matters to them. But do tell people, please, let's make this thing grow, not because we have to, but because we're speaking truth. Okay? Get the word out. So um, next time, we'll pick it up in part two of defining the rapture. Uh, where does it place...